Good evening. Uh, Pastor Burns here. We're going to walk our way through a survey of the book of Acts tonight. So we're glad that you're with us. We hope that you also, along with connecting tonight and spending some time with us, are also connecting to our other avenues that we're um, using during this really odd time in the church's life. But we're doing devos on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So last night, you heard from Gail Taylor, our women's ministry director, and she walked us through Acts 3 and 4. And then tomorrow night, you'll hear from Nate Southwick, our media director, and he'll walk us through a devotional on Acts as well. So we hope these times have been good for you and profitable. Um, I've enjoyed them. I hope that you have as well, but also want to encourage you. Sunday mornings, we're here. Uh, if you're connecting on live stream and virtually, we'd love to see you in person. Things have been going really well here in person, socially distanced, lots of... Uh, Regulations we're sticking to, but it's great to worship together. So I want to invite you there as well. We're going to be in the book of Acts tonight. So turn with me to Acts chapter 1. Now, the book of Acts is going to be interesting to cover in a one-night survey. Um, so I've taught this class and actually for a whole semester and uh, at a Bible college, but um, we're going to get through it in about the next 40 minutes or so. So I uh, hope that you'll stick with us and kind of, kind of run through here. So I'm going to pray. We're going to jump in, uh, walk our way through the 28 chapters here that are in Acts, and then we'll, uh, we'll pray again that the Lord continues to, to guide and direct our hearts and change us based upon what he shows us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our time. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the works of your Holy Spirit that are communicated to us through it. We thank you for those who have gone before us, who are faithful, who have followed you, who have served you, who have uh, loved others, who have endured persecution and have made their lives be about the advancement of the kingdom and the gospel. So I pray tonight, Lord, as we look at your word, that you would impact our hearts with it, that you would change us, that we would walk away different, more encouraged, more excited about who you are and what you've done for us, um, and more energized to share the gospel as you've called us to. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So, the book of Acts, uh, essentially where we're picking up here is right after Luke, and, and I know last week Pastor Larry kind of walked us through uh, the transition to the early church and then the epistles. And what we're focusing on here in Acts is really the same author as the Gospel of Luke. Luke writes this one as well, and you can see right at the beginning he starts off with that. He's writing to Theophilus. He says in the first book, O Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. And then he goes into Acts, and he goes from all that Jesus had begun to do and teach to the, to the disciples and those early believers into the ascension right here in chapter 1. And this is such a pivotal time in the life of the church. It goes from Jesus being present, walking, talking, eating with them, instructing them in the everyday things of life, to then he ascends into heaven here in Acts chapter 1, and the Holy Spirit comes down and indwells them. And from that point, it's not the guiding of the incarnate Christ in their life to, that's showing them how to live for God. It's now the Holy Spirit who is guiding, directing, enlightening, convicting, doing all of these things in the lives of these first century believers, and that forms the church. So we see this big transition right here in Acts chapter 1. Luke is on both sides of this, right? So Luke had walked with Jesus. He wrote the gospel uh, of, of the recording of Jesus' life incarnate here on earth. Now he's writing the actual account of the church itself and how the church grows and is empowered by the Holy Spirit. So there's different headings and different versions of Scripture. Maybe the top of yours when, in the book of Acts yours has the Acts of the Apostles. Um, I like a little bit different uh, emphasis there that actually would kind of bring it towards the acts of the Holy Spirit in the early church. So that's what I actually like a little bit better. So that's kind of how I work off of it. And my Bible even says the acts of the apostles, but I really see this as the acts of the Holy Spirit. How the Holy Spirit engages, moves, builds the church, empowers believers, does miraculous works through the believers and also in, in spite of the believers in some, time, in some instances here. Um, and then some specific believers who are uniquely uh, gifted to be impactful in the first century. We'll see some of those as we walk our way through. So I see the, the book kind of being split up into two sections. The first section is the first two chapters. Chapters one and two uh, are what I want to call the power of the church. It's the real description of the Holy Spirit indwelling and empowering the believer. 
and we get that laid out. We'll dig into it a little bit in a minute. So that's going to be our first section in chapter one and two. And then the second section is a much larger section, chapters three through 28. In chapters three through 28, really talk about the progress of the church. So the power for the church and the progress of the church. And those are kind of the two things that happen in this. Acts is a narrative book. So it's a, it's a recording of events. Uh, it's, it's almost like we would be doing now maybe like a live blog or live streaming of, of what's going on in the church. So Luke is recording events. He's giving them to us. He's including a lot of details, which I'm super appreciative of. Luke is the doctor. So you remember uh, that was his profession. He was a physician and he was a real detailed guy. And, th- and this particularly is a very detailed book, which is awesome for us to have preserved the real detail of what's happening in the first century as Jesus builds the church. So let's take a look at a couple pieces. Remember those two sections, the the power for the church, which is the Holy Spirit, and then the progress of the church, uh, which is how the church grew and expanded and really spread throughout all the known world at that particular time. There's a graphic that that we'll use and uh, we'll have up here on the screen for you called the Timeline of Acts and Beyond. So I always think it's helpful. I'm a little bit of a visual learner, so it's helpful for me to kind of see things broken down in, in one place. So this particular graphic shows you the 28 chapters, how they're kind of laid out there, and also some of the major events. Doesn't include everything, but the major events that are happening throughout the book of Acts um, from 30 AD to 62 AD. Those are basically the, the time period that's recorded here. It's about, it's roughly 32 years. That's not exactly precise, but in that area of 32 years from 30 to 62 AD. Um, And it also gives on this graphic underneath there some of the letters that were written by Paul. So Paul actually becomes, as we know, a very pivotal piece here in the book of Acts. His change from Saul to Paul upon his conversion. He then writes um, almost two-thirds of our New Testament. But uh, the place that we see here in this timeline shows us when those books were written. Those early letters to Romans, uh, the book to the, to the Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, First and Second Thessalonians, and Hebrews, are all kind of written in that uh, forty-five to sixty or fifty-eight A.D. kind of region. So Paul is super pivotal to those early churches. He serves the Lord well. He uh, becomes basically a church planter as he goes around in his apostolic function and begins these churches, helps begin these churches by sharing the gospel in these different cities. And then he doesn't just leave them um, afterwards. He stays in touch with them. He writes, um, he, he answers questions, he, he exhorts, he encourages, he also disciplines them, corrects them at different places. So the Holy Spirit is working through Paul in the majority of this book to really train and equip this, the early church here in these different churches in different cities. It's kind of a little bit of an encouragement to us as believers. This is the natural function that people who are following Jesus should be about in their lives. We should be about sharing the gospel at every opportunity that we get, seeing people respond to the gospel, and then walking in life and discipleship with them. And Paul gives us an amazing example. He's not the only one. A lot of these early um, church leaders did this very well. Paul gets a lot of his the events in his life recorded for us specifically. But um, there's a bunch of these places where we can see, hey, Paul loves these people. He cares for these people. They, they are messed up people. I mean, the, the churches are a mess in different ways, but they're also Holy Spirit empowered, and they're also the avenue that God chooses. So... As we're looking at Acts here, the avenue that God chooses to change the world is the church. And I know we live in a time when some of that can get a little convoluted. We can think that God's going to use other things or outside things. But the main mode of gospel change and impact in our world is the church. Jesus has said, that the gospel changes lives and we see that. And then we see the church changing whole cities in the early centuries. And that shouldn't be uncommon for us today. We should adhere to that same guiding principle. In a day and age when commitment is low and connection is lacking and um, it's easy to flow in and out of lots of different societal and cultural pieces, including the church, I think as believers, we need to take this to heart. The kind of commitment and sacrifice 
and intensity and joy that we see these early believers having because they're around the church itself. And then the churches that get started in the first century through Acts here and then going forward in the epistles we'll talk about later. But this is the kind of, the church can look like this now if we have the same kind of guiding principles that we see here in scripture. So I hope that graphic was helpful there. A little bit of a timeline. We see Acts 1 through 8. It's kind of when Pentecost is happening. Stephen gets killed, which is the impetus for uh, actually the gospel going forward uh, in much of Acts in chapter 9. Uh, Paul gets converted on the road to Damascus. Uh, then we see chapters 10, 11, 12 through 14. And then we get to 15. The Council of Jerusalem happens. It's a very pivotal time. Um, and not only in the early church, in, in the church in general, even till today, the, the Jerusalem Council. We see Paul writing these early letters and then a major transition in 60 AD where the gospel just goes out, um, the outside of the Jewish uh, influence and the Jewish target and crowd that it had previously all kind of been surrounded by. This is what God uses Paul to do throughout Acts and then going forward is take the gospel to the rest of the world, the Gentiles, which if you're like me, I, I'm not of Jewish descent, so I'm super thankful <laughs> that the Lord saw fit to do that and graft the rest of us in to his plan. So I want to take a look at some key passages um, and walk our way through. I can't hit all of them. Um, we could spend a lot of time reading passages in Acts, but I'm going to help you hit a few verses. So if you, it, my notes should be eventually up with this video, but if you have a pen or paper or you're taking notes somewhere, write some of this down. So we're going to hit, uh, let's see, how many do I have here? Three, six, nine different verses, passages um, that I believe are kind of key to understanding the movement of the early church. The first one is this, right in chapter one. It's a very familiar passage. If you were with us at our devotionals last week, we talked about this one as well. Uh, but right in chapter one, verses seven through nine. So if you look at chapter one of Acts seven through nine, it says this. This is still Jesus talking. It's right before the ascension. He says, he said to them, Jesus says to them, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons that the father is fixed by his own authority, but... You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That verse is actually what the entire account of Acts is. It's all about the movement of the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling the believers and then going out. It starts in Jerusalem. There's a huge cultural shift there and the gospel just impacts Thousands of people. And then from Jerusalem, it starts to go out. Judea, surrounding areas, Samaria, the neighboring uh, region, and then also all the way out to the ends of the earth. And we see that right here in Acts, that particular movement all through this book. So if there's one thing that describes to us what Acts is, it's Acts 1.8. That's our thesis for the whole rest of the letter is that happening in lots of different ways as we go forward through Peter, through John, through Stephen, through Paul, through many other believers and through the churches that get planted in the first century. That's what we're seeing in the whole rest of this letter. So a second key passage is in chapter two. So flip over with me to chapter two. We're gonna look at verses 36 through 41 of chapter two. And this is on the back end of right after Pentecost happened. So Pentecost is this pivotal moment that Jesus was talking about in chapter one. The, the believers are all gathered. They're waiting for the, the helper that Jesus promises them, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells them. And you know, remember the miraculous events that happen around that. They start speaking different languages, spoken languages. And it's just this whole miraculous event that basically helps the gospel go forward into lots of different regions. Uh, from there going forward. But right after Pentecost happens, the Holy Spirit indwells them, Peter gives a sermon. Could be, lots of commentators call this the greatest sermon ever written. Um, I, I'm pretty sure he didn't have time to write it. I'm sure he didn't write it at all, actually. He just, the Holy Spirit indwelt him and he was just started preaching. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit that we need to remember in our own lives. Remember, Peter, Peter was not a super great orator before this. Peter basically acted first and maybe thought afterwards, but he was very assertive. Um, he was very vocal. He was also very controversial before this. Remember in the Gospels, all the different actions that Peter was part of, even right up to the Garden of Gethsemane where he swipes off a guard's ear trying to defend Jesus, which 
is a whole interesting dynamic that we don't have time to dig into. But um, that Peter versus the Peter we see here in chapter two of Acts, a very different Peter, indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So salvation and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit changes people. It makes us different. And Peter's a great example of that with this sermon. And I can't, I don't have time to unpack all of it, but we're going to go to verse 36. And I'm going to read down through verse 41 as, as a key passage here. Acts 2.36 says this, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? See, this is a natural result of the preaching of the gospel is people should be asking the question, what do we do? Now that I've heard this, this miraculous set of events that Jesus brought to us and then his death and resurrection and the way that he changes lives and now we're, we're accountable to this information, they're basically saying to him. And they say, Peter, what do we do now? Now that we know this, we crucified him, but now we know who he truly was. And Peter's response is so key here in verse 38. Peter says to them, repent and be baptized. And if there's anything that is the synopsis of the early church and should be the synopsis of the church today. It's repent and be baptized. That's the instructions. That's what Jesus said to do in Matthew 28, uh, teach people to repent and be baptized. It's, this is the mode of operation for what believers step into when faith changes their hearts. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all those who are far off, everyone whom the Lord your God calls to himself. And with many other words, he, Peter, bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Huge, pivotal passage here. As Peter wraps up his sermon, the people ask what do we do in light of what you just told us? He instructs them very clearly, repent and be baptized. It's a challenge for us as believers. Do we know how to answer those questions? So if somebody asks, man, what do I do with my life? And you've been sharing the gospel with them. Do you know how to respond quickly, succinctly, clearly? Here's what God is asking of you. Repent and be baptized and become part of the church. And then, live in light of all those, those truths. The Holy Spirit comes to indwell us as the promise. So that's another key passage. Obviously, there's more key passages. Even here in the end of chapter two, talks about the fellowship of the believers there. But I'm going to move you over to chapter three. So flip over to chapter three with me. Another key passage in the walk through Acts here. And uh, in chapter three, whoops, I looked at the wrong place. Chapter three, verse nine. In verse 9 of chapter 3, this is the event, and Gail kind of talked us through this last night with the lame beggar being healed, but this is such a pivotal spot. I, this might be actually my favorite interaction in all of Scripture. Um, this lame man who's been lame since birth, he gets healed by Peter and John. His faith heals him. Peter and John are clear about that. He, get, he gets healed, and he basically jumps up and starts dancing around the temple, running and leaping and just singing God's praises. So look at verse 9 here. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called, called Solomon's. And they were astounded. This interaction should be, it shouldn't just be for the lame beggar at the gates of the temple. It should be for all of us. Do we walk around, literally in verse 9 it says, walking and praising God. Do people observe that in our lives? And as they do, who gets the credit? See, this lame beggar went and clung to Peter and John. And Peter and John were super clear going forward. Don't think that we did this and we don't want to take the credit for it. So don't, this is a term I use, don't be glory stealers. Don't try to take God's glory when miraculous things happen around us or even in us or through us. 
Don't try to steal God's glory. Peter and John were super clear about doing that. They gave glory to Jesus. They redirected it and said, it's not us, it's him. Next key passage in chapter four. Look over at chapter four. I'm going to read verses nine through 12 for us um, as we are just a little bit further in to, to the work here. Verse nine of chapter 12, actually verse eight of chapter four. Four, verse eight, down through 12. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, remember they're being examined now, they were thrown in prison for this healing of a lame man. He says, if we're being con- uh, concerned now due, uh, due to a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you that the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. This another key soundbite from Acts here. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. One of the most important things I think we need to take from the book of Acts is the clarity of the gospel presentation. You don't have to mix words when you're telling people about who changes the world and who changes your life and who changes other people's lives. It should be crystal clear. It was crystal clear for Peter and John here. They wanted to make sure. They said, if we're going to get thrown in jail, let's just be clear about why. We're being thrown in jail because a lame man was healed and it wasn't even us that did it. It is clearly Jesus of Nazareth. He says, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That is one of my favorite verses as well. Chapter five, switch over there with me as we keep looking at some key passages in the movement through Acts Chapter 5, verse 29, I'm going to read down through 32. 29 through 32 in chapter 5. It says, But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. <laughs> That's a great statement. <laughs> we must obey God rather than men. Why did they have to say that? They had to say it because they were being told to stop preaching about Jesus. And they basically said, even in prison, while in prison and being examined and possibly sentenced, they said, there's nothing we can do. You can keep telling us to stop talking about Jesus. We're going to keep doing what God tells us, not what you tell us. We're going to keep doing what God tells us. We must obey God rather than men. Verse 30, chapter 5. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Obey is a key word here in two of these verses, verse 29 and in verse 32. Obey is a word that is not a super popular one in our particular uh, context in today's day and age. Obeying is kind of this thing that nobody really wants to ever do. And the reality is, if you're going to follow Jesus well, you have to obey. It's part of the deal. Without it, you're not following well. Peter and John knew that. It had been made clear to them. Here they state it. We must obey God rather than men. And then they push it out to others as well. The Holy Spirit will come upon those who obey those who obey in faith, that recognize we're sinners, we need a savior, Jesus is that savior, and he has conquered sin and Satan and death. So we will obey and repent. The Holy Spirit indwells those. Verse chapter six, another key passage here as we're moving. Chapter six is this place in scripture where the deacons um, in the early church are instituted. And really that word just means servants. Um, And they are instituted for a specific reason in chapter 6. They're they're put into place because the early church apostles, the the leaders, they they were inundated. There was too much work for them to be done, and some things were falling through the cracks. So particularly the Hellenist widows, they they weren't getting the help that they needed, that, that the church should be providing. And there were some factions in there and some things, and the apostles just couldn't get to everything. So these early church elders that are there, that are leading the church, they didn't have the ability to get to all the needs that were out there. And in chapter six, we see deacons commissioned. So let's read those first seven verses of chapter six. It gives us the picture of that. It 
It says, Now in these days, the early days of the church, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up the preaching of the, of the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. They chose Stephen, a man of full, full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And they sat before the disciples, and they prayed and laid hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So the whole interaction here is there's needs that aren't getting met. The apostles, those early church elders, they're not able to get to everything that is entailed with serving all the needs. So they institute these seven men as the first deacons in the church. And their basic job was take care of the needs. We will take care of the ministry of the word and prayer. That's what we will focus on. It doesn't mean they didn't meet any needs. They did. But that was their main focus. And then for the deacons, their, their main focus was serving the needs of the believers and disciples. Another key passage, jump over to chapter 10. So in chapter 10, uh, we see verse 44. So 10 verse 44. This transition here, as Peter is instructed by God, he has this interaction with Cornelius and Cornelius uh, is... It, it's a really cool. We don't have time to unpack it. I'm going to have to keep moving. But look at verse 44 of chapter 10. It says, While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the environment now is not Jews. They're Gentiles that are listening to Peter. The Holy Spirit falls on those who heard the word. The believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? He commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then he asked them to remain for some days and he, and he taught them. But this is the transition in chapter 10 where the Holy Spirit is poured out on the Gentiles, on the non-Jewish population that God calls into his family. And we see that transition, which basically is the transition that changes the entire course here, not only in the book of Acts, but really in the first century church and, and even till today, that the gospel goes outside of just the Jewish population that it had been originally kind of, not confined to, because there was other people already grafted in, but that it was primarily for, and now the gospel gets primarily spread towards everyone. So key passage here in chapter 10. Now turn a couple pages, probably in your Bible, over to chapter 16. In chapter 16, verse 30, I want to read just verses 30 and 31. This is the account of another huge event in the book of Acts, the Philippian jailer. And the Philippian jailer, uh, if you remember, um, Paul and Silas are in prison. Uh, they're, they're locked way down in the, in the bottom of the prison in the darkest place. They, but they're singing. They're singing hymns. And everybody thinks they're crazy. But there's an earthquake. <clears throat> All the uh, cells get turned open. Uh, they can leave. And the jailer is basically afraid for his life. So the jailer comes and, and Paul keeps all the, the prisoners there. And then we have this interaction in verse 30. Or I'm going to back up to verse 28. Paul cries with a loud voice to the jailer. He's, a, he's about to probably take his own life. He had drew, drew, drew his sword and he was going to kill himself because he knew that's what it would require. And Paul cries out in verse 28, Do not harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights and he rushes in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Just the fact that Paul and Silas remained in a place of imprisonment because they knew what, it would ha what would happen to the jailer and his family if they had left, it changes the jailer's entire life. Let's look at verse 30. Then he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They heard Paul and Silas's worship. They saw their actions. And then it saved his literal life. And he then says, please save my spiritual eternal life. So he said that in verse 31, they said to him, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. See, again, we see this clarity of gospel presentation. Somebody asks, what do I do? 
Paul and Silas respond, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, be baptized, and that's it. See, this kind of clarity is what we need to remember. The early church is growing by thousands and tens of thousands and in different places and cities and all through the known world eventually. And the reason is because people were faithful to the gospel and obedient, like Paul and Silas here, like Peter and John earlier and many others, but they're faithful and obedient. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. And as their lives and their words impact people around them, they know exactly what to say. They tell them, repent and believe. Once you repent and believe, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Be baptized as a witness to others. This is the very simple formula of the early gospel in the early church that we need to remember and be clear about. Turn to Acts 21 with me here. A final key passage, not that it's the only other key passage in Acts, but a final key passage I want to share tonight. Acts 21, verses 13 and 14. In Acts 21, 13, uh, this is much later now. Paul's been converted on the road to Damascus. Um, the Lord impacts him there. Huge, obviously, pivotal event that we didn't just read, but uh, we can talk about a little bit. Um, he is persecuting the church. He's gotten a letter that basically absolves him of any responsibility for persecuting, even killing Christians in the name of the name of Jesus. The Lord meets him on the road to Damascus, knocks him off his horse, blinds him and talks to him. And Paul repents and believes. At the time, his name was Saul. He then goes through a process. He, he gets healed of his blindness. He engages, goes back to Jerusalem. He, all this process where he basically is discipled into the faith that he is now part of. And then he goes out as really the, the most pivotal church starter, church planter and apostle in the, in the New Testament as he travels all over the known world. Here we're on the back end of after a few missionary journeys, which we're going to look at in a minute. Uh, briefly, we'll show a, a map, a graphic of his missionary journeys. But here we're on the back end of this um, book. And Paul is basically, he's getting ready to go back to Jerusalem. But everybody knows if he shows his face in Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested and probably either killed or imprisoned and tortured. And they don't want that for him. So they're pleading with him and praying and weeping that he wouldn't do this. That's where we pick up in, in Acts 21, verse 13. Paul answers, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I'm ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. See, all of a sudden, Luke's talking and including himself here, the first person. We ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. The faith and intensity that Paul has about doing what he knows will spread the gospel, even if it comes at personal cost, even if it comes at imprisonment or death, Paul says, I am going to do it. Just like Peter and John said earlier. Remember in the beginning of what we were talking about here, Peter and John said, hey, we must obey God, not man. We're going to do what God told us to do, no matter what. Paul says the same thing here. They're pleading with him, please don't go. You'll be arrested. You'll be tortured probably. You'll probably even be killed. And Paul says, I'm ready. I'm ready to do whatever it takes to obey what God has called me to do. Now, we also know Paul does end up going to Jerusalem. He does end up being imprisoned. He does end up being taken all the way to Rome. We'll talk about that in a minute, uh, but all because of his faith. So those are just some key verses. Um, I gave you nine of those. Hopefully you either wrote them down or got a chance to look at them. There's many other places in the book of Acts that are key and pivotal points in the New Testament. We don't have enough time to unpack all of them. But I want to give you a few important things that happen here just in a timeline in the book of Acts as well. First, the first important thing we get in Acts is the history of the early church. So the early church and how it functioned and how it got laid out and how it grew, we have a recording of that history. The the believers that laid down their lives for, for the early church, Stephen, uh, Paul later, uh, many of the early apostles, almost all the disciples. So we, we know that they gave their lives for the mission of the gospel. And that's the history of the early church. Secondly, uh, second important things we see, thing we see here in this book is a continuation of Jesus' work. So 
The seamless transition of Jesus' earthly incarnate ministry through the Gospels, and then as he ascends to heaven and sends the Holy Spirit, the same kind of thing continues on. The same work of God and the work of the Holy Spirit continues on through the book of Acts. Instead of just through Jesus, it now is happening through all the believers in, in a little bit different way, but churches are started and growing. and It's a continuation of Jesus' work. Thirdly, we see some amazingly inspired sermons by Stephen, by Peter, by Paul. We see these sermons that these men didn't previously, or at least that we have recorded, have the ability to even speak in these ways, but the Holy Spirit empowered them and spoke through them. We see the work of prayer. One of the interesting things in that interaction with the lame beggar um, in Acts chapter 2 is Peter and John encountered that lame beggar And if you go back and look at the the passage here, they encountered him because they were being obedient by going to the temple to pray. So because they were obedient in prayer, they have the opportunity to see Jesus heal through them, a lame beggar, and then see the gospel go forth. He runs around praising God, and then they get imprisoned, and they eventually get released. But the issue even in that is their imprisonment was even to preach the gospel. So prayer is this impetus that happens behind all of God's work. Do we remember that? Do we recognize that? We also see another important thing in Acts is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers the believers and does all of the uh, changing and empowering and convicting and also the miraculous works that we see through through the book, through this recording from from Brother Luke here. It's one of the reasons why I like the title being the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, through the apostles, but or the acts of the Holy Spirit in the early church uh, for the name of this book, not just the acts of the apostles. It's really the Holy Spirit that's doing all the work here. It's the, the Holy Spirit as a person of the Trinity indwelling the early church and working miraculously all around. Another important thing that we see in the book of Acts is conversions. Thousands. By the hundreds in some place, by the thousands in others. Thousands of conversions. People hearing a clear gospel message. What can I do? How do I fix it? How do I fix my life? How do I secure my eternity? How do I get through this time that we're in? How do we deal with persecution and drought? It's all the same answer. Repent and believe. Be baptized and follow the Lord. Another important thing we see in the book of Acts is how churches solve problems. They listen to their leaders. When there was an issue or a disagreement or there was sin in the church, they, they went to their spiritual leaders. They allowed them to have spiritual authority in their lives to discipline, to correct, to encourage, to, to, to move them in directions that reflected the gospel and the power of God. So how churches solve problems. There's a lot of content here on that that we don't have time to unpack, but it's in there. We also see how churches were organized with these leaders, these pastors and local churches and the elders and the apostles, the elders, and then the deacons that came behind them in Acts chapter 7 or Acts chapter 6 as they're instituted, those first seven deacons, uh, we see how the church is organized, how God chose to organize the church, which is a key piece. And then lastly, an important thing, we see how the gospel was preached to the world. It was preached at every opportunity and it was preached clearly. Another thing I want to take a look at just briefly in our survey of Acts here is uh, a graphic that we'll put up here for you. And it's the missionary journeys um, that, that Paul went on. And they, sometimes we see it say there's three missionary journeys. It's actually four because even that last one that he ended up imprisoned and journeying all the way to Rome, that's a missionary journey. Why? Because every believer is a missionary all the time. So Paul was a missionary when he was free to roam and roam around and go to different cities and disciple people and share the gospel in the synagogues and in the courts and in the, and in the marketplaces. He was a missionary then. And he was also a missionary when he was in chains and he was getting moved on boats and, and through different places of imprisonment all the way to Rome. He's equally a missionary then. So there's really four missionary journeys that we see. And on this graphic, it's, it's color coded for you. And this, one of the reasons we picked this one It's amazing to see how Paul moved all through really his known world at this point, consistently preaching the gospel. He was on a mission that God had given him and he didn't waste any time. 
He was also, if you'll see here as you look, there's a lot of backtracking and revisiting to these towns. So he maintained these relationships and he discipled people over a long period of time. It wasn't just the, the couple months he was in a town or, or even some places a couple years in a town. It was a long-term lifetime investment and he wrote letters back to them. That's where we have the epistles. He instructed them or he would come back on another missionary journey and visit them and see how the church was going and what he could help with. So... We see a lot of overlap in these missionary journeys as you're looking at them. And we also see on this map, on the, on the key at the bottom there, the different color codings for the missionary journeys, you'll see where those missionary journeys are found. So Paul really sets out in Acts chapter 12, and from that point to the end of the book and through Acts 28, from 12 to 28 are these missionary accounts uh, that Paul goes on. And he goes with Barnabas, he goes with Silas, he, he works with Timothy and, and many others as he goes. So he's not the only missionary uh, moving around, but he seems to be the apostolic leader of these mission uh, journeys here in the first century. So I hope that graphic's helpful for you too, not only while you're reading Acts and the events that happen here, but then also as you, we continue on, as you read the epistles, all these letters, it's good to go back to stuff like this and look and say, okay, where was that in relation to when Paul was going and at what time period and how many times did he visit that city? It's all super helpful information as you're kind of taking in all the instruction that comes uh, through the epistles. So I particularly like this one. Um, it shows us all that. The purple line is the one that he um, ends up in imprisoned uh, from Jerusalem and taken in captivity. That one was, and it's all through there and long ship rides. And he ends up going through nicely Syracuse over in Sicily. He goes right through Syracuse up through and he ends up in Rome where the conclusion of his life happens there in Rome. So, um, or the conclusion of his imprisonment as well there. So he defends the gospel all the way through. Every court he's brought in front of, every ruler or judge he's put in front of, he is just consistently defending the gospel, preaching Jesus, calling them to repentance. That's all he does. Continues all the way through on that last journey as well. So hopefully that's a helpful graphic for you that uh, kind of walks you through that. The last graphic we want to show you is, is the book in a glance. And this, this book at a glance is helpful, especially uh, I'm going to encourage your parents out there if you have kids. Um, this is an easy little one page thing to show uh, your kids. Uh, download it, print it off, use it, um, or just show it to them on a screen that you can. It gives us the book at a glance. It's not as much detail as we just covered, but uh, it's... It's the fifth book of the New Testament, who the author is, when, at what time it was written. It shows some famous stories that are in there, also some key verses, and then some important points at the bottom. It's, it's your surface introduction to Acts, and it's super helpful, not just for kids. It's, it's helpful for kids, but for all of us to be able to kind of remember all that God's doing here through this particular account. So we could spend a lot more time in the book of Acts. We don't have it tonight, but... Um, I'm thankful that you have joined us and spent some time with us. Um, I want to encourage you really as well. Uh, as we go through uh, these surveys of different parts of Scripture and as we look at and think about all that God is doing or has done in history and wants to do through us even now, um, don't let it just be information that we take in. Let it be things that, let it be information that changes your heart, that because you've cho chosen to believe in it. Don't just let it be stuff, oh, that's nice, that's a recording of history, Acts is a narrative, it's a historical account. It, it's more than that. It's the work of the Holy Spirit changing people, cities, churches, and entire cultures and spreading the church through the first century. So take that today. The, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that indwelt the believers at Pentecost, that gave Peter the insight to preach that sermon, that empowered him and John in prison, that changed Paul's life, that led him on those missionary journeys, that consistently gave him the right words to preach the gospel. That, that same Holy Spirit indwells every believer who believes that Jesus died for their sins. So remember that in your everyday life. That, that kind of power is the same power we can live with in our everyday. Are we able to give direct, clear answers like we see all through the book of Acts? When people ask, maybe you'll get this one. It'd be great if you did. What must I do to be saved? Like the Philippian jailer. That's, that's easy. Well, you better get that one right. But even people that just say, how do I fix my life? How do I 
get out of this, this particular hole that I'm in? How do I see hope in the world? Where is peace coming from? Let the answer be clear. Repent and believe. Jesus has died, has done all that you need. And then, if you're baptized, continue to grow, continue to learn all that he's taught us. That is what will change your life and mine, and that's what will change our world. So let's pray, let's close. Let's ask the Lord to help do that through us, just like we're seeing here next. Father, we thank you for all that you've done through history, through what you've done for us, and what you're doing through us. We thank you for what you're going to do in the future. Lord, it blows our minds the way that you work, the way that you lovingly, perfectly, um, and sacrificially had came to save us, and then send the Holy Spirit to help us and to change us. Lord, we pray that we would listen to the work of the Spirit in our lives, that we would be led by you. And that as you lead us, we would give clear answers for the gospel. And that it would change our lives, that it would change the lives of those around us, it would continue to grow and change our church, and that it would change other people in this world. And that many churches would be started, many believers would be brought to you into the family, many churches started, and the gospel would continue to go forward. We're thankful that we get to be a part of it. It's in your name we pray. Amen.